we don't ever get involved in what other teams' plans are. We just try to match up as best we possibly can with the lineup. Felix Hernandez was scheduled to start tonight, but the Mariners, in the minds of some, are reacting to this early July series like it's the end of September because they are hosting the Oakland A's this weekend and they are saving Hernandez for the opening game of that series tomorrow. So reliever Tom Wilhelmson, the closer here for a couple of years, he will make his first major league start tonight against the Twins. And Ron Gardenhire rolling with the punches saying, hey, you know, whatever they have to do, they have to do. We'll react as best we can. The Menards batting order for the Twins. I guess this is their reaction. Brian Dozier leading off. Kurt Suzuki batting second. Chris Parmalee third. Kendris Morales, Josh Willingham, Oswaldo Arcia, Trevor Plouffe, Eduardo Escobar, and Sam Fold. And that lineup will, as Dick said, Opposed Tom Wilhelmson. We look at his uh, season numbers. He has been a closer. He's been in long relief much of this season. He went to the Meyer Leagues and pitched some and started some games in the Meyer League. So twins don't really know what to expect just yet. They've seen him plenty of times in one and two inning stints. Don't know what to expect as a starter. Northland Ford defense for the Mariners. Andy Chavez, James Jones, Michael Saunders in the outfield. Kyle Seeger, Willie Bloomquist, Robinson Cano, Logan Morris in the infielders, Mike Zanino behind the plate. I don't know if we look at uh, Dale Scott, the crew chief, has plate duty, Barksdale, Danley Morales on the bases. I don't know if Lloyd McClendon has ever been able to do a handstand, but he would do one here tonight, I think, if Will Helmson gives him three innings. Uh, he would love to get three innings uh, inside of 50 or 60 pitches from Tom Will Helmson, no question about it. And the first pitch down and away, ball one. Wilhelmson has an intriguing arm. They had no question about that. They thought he could be a closer. He's a 96, 97 mile an hour fastball type of guy, and they're trying to find a spot for him. Up and in. I beg your pardon. Dale Scott calls that a strike, one and one. Now the Mariners have a very good bullpen, and a lot of power arms in that bullpen, and it's. Um, a bit surprising that right before the All Star break, they're asking this bullpen to put together a, a nine inning game. They hope a win in advance of uh, the Oakland series and then the All Star break. And it'll be Seattle's bullpen against Oakland's bullpen in the three game series. The ball fouled back. But, you know, how much will that bullpen be taxed in advance of the Oakland series by? Having this game here on the heels of last night's game when they didn't get much from their starter. Right, and they weren't counting on uh, that last night, and they certainly are betting big on King Felix pitching uh, well into the uh, game against Oakland tomorrow. The ball hit into the shift. Cano is right behind the second base bag, one away. They're intrigued here with the notion that this Mariner team can get into postseason play. They're in a very tough division. We all know that. Oakland. Leading Seattle by eight and a half games, but the Mariners feel that the Angels can be reached eventually. Right now, if the season ended, the Mariners would be the second wild card team. One down, and now Kurt Suzuki. Suzuki with a couple of hits last night, has the average back over 300, and a ball fouled to the screen. Well, just to complete your thought, I think, Dick, about what could happen in this Mariner bullpen if for some reason Felix Hernandez doesn't pitch Hernandez S tomorrow night against Oakland, then it, the bullpen could be in serious trouble. No question about it. Outside, one and one. So they are putting an awful lot of their chips on the table behind uh, uh, Felix Hernandez uh, uh, pitching well and beating Oakland. Tomorrow night. Jeff Samarja will start for the A's. Yeah, tomorrow. what a matchup. Love, love, love to be in the ballpark for that one. And a call strike one and two. Suzuki not fond of that strike call, I gather. One and two. Batter 
batter's box two and two. The bullpen over the last 18 games has pitched to a 0.77 ERA. Brandon Maurer was uh, originally penciled in to pitch second today, but he was burnt up last night in the game. Something the Twins are not at all disappointed with at 97, 8 mile an hour fastball <laughs> was coming up there last night. And now three and two with Parmalee on deck. Full count to Suzuki with one out and the Twins first. And the ball fouled back. After the game, the Twins fly to Denver. They'll take on the Rockies for three games before coming home Sunday night. And then Suzuki will hit the ground running Monday morning with All Star Game responsibilities. And another foul. Thompson has already thrown a dozen pitches. And Suzuki takes a walk. Oh, good plate appearance by Suzuki. And with Parmalee coming to the plate, let's check in with Kevin Gord. Guys, I had a conversation with Chris Parmalee earlier today about the strategy when you're facing the bullpen by committee. First thing he said is, most guys that come out of the bullpen are trying to throw strikes early. We need to attack early in the count. The second thing he said, it's, it's a lot like a spring training game. You know you're going to see three, four, maybe five different pitchers. So don't bank on getting better as the game goes on by learning one guy. Be ready to hit each and every time and take each at bat like spring training on its own. We'll see how it works out tonight for Parmalee and the Twins. And Parmalee takes down and in ball one. Two years ago, actually it was last year, Wilhelmson was in his second year as a closer, and one of the reasons he was taken out of that role or not brought back this year, control. Parmalee strokes one to right. Saunders with the catch. Pretty well hit ball for out number two. Last year, 24 saves for Wilhelmson. 59 innings pitched, but 33 walks. And Maybe predictably, the first base runner the Twins get against Wilhelmson came on a free pass. Two down, that'll bring up Kendris Morales. Yeah, and I seem to remember a, a game, I think it was last year, in uh, Target Field when uh, he came in to close the game and walked two or three guys yeah. in a row, walked yeah. the bases loaded, and the Twins end up winning. And that has been a problem for uh, Wilhelmson. You cannot walk guys in the closing role. And not only did he, did he walk a lot of guys, but it was 2-0 and 3-1. Oh and to a lot of guys as well. And guys would get hits with men that had been put on base via the walk. 97 mile per hour fastball gets a swing and a miss from Morales. Tapper headed up the middle. And a nice play by the shortstop Bloomquist. Cano let him have it even though it was on the first base side of second base. And the Twins are done on the first.
batting order for Seattle. Andy Chavez in left field, the leadoff man again here tonight. James Jones batting second. A couple of All-Stars, Cano and Seeger hitting third and fourth. And Corey Hart, Logan Morrison, Michael Saunders, Michael Zanino, and Willie Bloomquist. And for the Twins, the young man, Johan Pino, on the mound. Here's the uh, Mall of America scouting report. He has to command his fastball. That means be able to throw it on both sides of the plate, not in the middle. Use his breaking ball, mix up his pitches a lot, throw that curveball for strikes, and don't walk people. This is a lineup that you can pitch to. Don't give him any free passes. Chavez takes strike one. Pino with four big league starts, and in two of them, he pitched well enough to win, but didn't win. The other two, not so much. Hoping to get his first major league win here tonight. And the pitch is up one and one. In his last start against the Yankees, six innings, three hits, one run. But the, the Twins didn't do any uh, run scoring. The ball lifted to right. And Arcia back a few steps. One away. Northland Ford defense for the Twins. You've seen Arcia in right. Fold is in center. And Josh Willingham is in left. Blue Fescobar, Dozier, Parmalee, the infielders. Colabello starting the day on the bench. And the Kurt Suzuki again behind the plate. One down, James Jones, the batter. And a first pitch strike. We talk about command of, of your pitches and, and commanding the fastball. What that means is being able to throw the ball four strikes. But quality strikes, something that's not in the middle. You have command of your fastball. When you want to throw it on the outside corner, you throw it there or just off. And likewise for the inside corner. And what happens when you have good command, when, you know, nobody can throw the ball on the corners every time. You're going to make some mistakes and throw it in the middle. But if you're throwing the ball on the corners most of the time, you, you tend to get away with the ones on down the middle. Whereas if you're not spotting the fastball well, either throwing balls or throwing it down the middle a lot, hitters sense that, get more aggressive, more selective, and start tattooing that ball in the middle of the plate. One and two. Another high fastball, two and two. I'm talking with Kyle Gibson today about his start last night. Now remembering, he pitched six shutout innings last night. Said he didn't have very good command of his fastball at all. Didn't feel his changeup was all that great, but had a good breaking ball. Ball flipped foul and then back into the seats. And I asked Ron Gardenhire whether that's isn't that one of those starts where you're looking for progress from a young man who needs to learn how to pitch, how to win without having a whole lot of stuff or command out there. That's exactly right. In, in, in his starts that he has not pitched well, it's it's been lack of command, and I think. The foul. Inexperienced to know how do I get past uh, and, uh, the fact that I don't have my my best stuff or I don't I'm not throwing it where I want to. How do I? How can I still compete? When he's got his good stuff, when he knows he's got command, he's been terrific. And the maturation process is exactly as you say, Dick. How can I give my team a chance to win when I don't have my best stuff? I will tell you, if he thinks he didn't have good command or his best stuff last night, it, I thought it was pretty good. And the ball slapped to left. And a base hit for Jones with one out in the first. And that'll bring up Robinson Cano. Tonight's cold hard facts presented by Frost Brood Coors Light. Take a look at Pino's first four major league starts and a good debut against the White Sox. And a good one as we said last time against the uh, Yankees. Pitched very well against the Yankees after the Yankees had Kind of tattooed other Twins pitchers that Pino came in and started the ball game and pitched very, very well. I hope he could do that tonight. I have a, a very good recollection of that ball game against the Yankees where he was spotting his fastball well and threw a lot of really good breaking balls. So we'll see if he decides to do that tonight. Teams are two for two against Pino in stealing bases, and he's gotten one ground ball double play.
wouldn't be surprised if uh, Jones has a green light and actually does try try to steal here, even with Cano up. Mariners not scoring a lot of runs. This guy's 17 for 18 in stolen bases. Outside, ball one. They may keep that. They may keep him at first base and keep that hole open on the right side for Robinson Cano. But I'd be surprised if sometime during this inning, Jones isn't taken off for second base. And a strike called one and one. Cano will be there Tuesday night. Starting for the American League at second base in the All Star game. Jones has provided a spark. Stealing bases when he's gotten on base. Pretty much a singles hitter, but when you can steal second, that makes up for closer play at first. He just barely got back. If you can steal second, then then some of those singles eventually uh, could be interpreted as doubles if they you're standing like, at second absolutely. base. They look like doubles if you uh, get to second within the three or four pitches. One and one to Cano. And there goes the run. And the ball slapped foul. Spun back over the net. Looked like Jones had a really good jump there. Sure got dirty. <laughs> Andy Van Slyke talking to him. And he must have heard contact with the uh, ball, even though it was a foul ball. And to go in head first when you, when the the ball's been contacted, is you might want to take a look around a little bit. And now two and two. Twins uh, beat the Mariners two out of three in Minnesota. They've won uh, two out of the first three here in Seattle. Fourth time that Jones has been chased back to the bag. And time call. Seeger on deck. Five walks in the four starts for Pino. Now pitch to 22 big league innings. So walks haven't been a big issue. He doesn't want to issue one here. Jones goes. And the pitch popped up to center field. Dozier tried to deke. Jones catches made out number two. And that'll bring up Kyle Seeger. Big out there for the young man. Johan Pino getting Robinson Cano. Drastically cuts down the opportunity for a big Seattle inning when you can uh, get by that guy, Cano, all star second baseman, once again, seemingly perennially. Seeger with the runner at first and no time called. I think James Jones need to continue cleaning up his <laughs> wardrobe. Down and in. Ball one. Mariners have scored three runs in this series. A couple of solo home runs and a sacrifice fly. They have really struggled over the last four games with 
runners in scoring position just one for 30 so maybe they'll keep Jones here because they figure they stand a better chance of scoring him from first than second <laughs> anyway. That's close. Yeah, he caught him. He caught him flinching towards second. There it was a nice uh, pickoff move. Nice quick feet by Pino and almost, almost got Jones at first. He was going for sure. If you watch him here, he makes a little flinch towards second. He was going. Chris Parmley thought he had him. I think if he, if if Parmley had not had to dig that ball out of the dirt a little bit, he might have been able to slap a uh, little bit quicker tag down. Might have had him right there. Ron Gardenhire is going to come out. And We've seen pickoff plays be reviewed here. And I think we're going to potentially have a review of that pickoff play. Yeah, Guard is going to go out there and take enough time to have Sean Harlan, the video coordinator, take a look at it. He's out. Yeah, I think he might be. It was, it was a very nice catch and tag by Parmley, very quick. Right there, his hand isn't on the bag yet. With. The leather touching the arm there. There's the tag right there, and you can see his fingers have not touched the bag yet. So we think this is going to be a successful challenge. The guard tire lingering, having a few uh, social uh, exchanges with Kyle Seeger. Probably telling him what we're at restaurants to go to in Minneapolis for the All Star game. And a uh, out call is made, absolutely. So the Twins challenge the pickoff move. Jones ends up being picked off. And Seeker instead will lead off the second inning. Minnesota Twins feeling good right now about their baseball team. Eduardo Escobar was not in the lineup last night. He's the cheerleader you hear every single night in the dugout. Come on, come on, guys. Well, I talked to him today about the way they're feeling right now, and he says the pitching's been great. Defense throughout has been really good this series, and he thinks that's carried over now to the plate. They feel like a different baseball team than the team that left town after that frustrating series, guys, against the New York Yankees. And, boy, through 162 games, there's going to be ebb and flow. But right now, they look like they're on the uptick. Maybe get a little momentum here, winning a series tonight. Maybe win a series this weekend and have a good feeling as they go into the All-Star break and come back fresh for that second half. Thank you, Kevin. And that second half will start with a week-and-a-half-long homestand. So, you know, the Twins uh, realize that they've kind of separated themselves from the 500 mark by a bunch. But if you can win this series, win the Colorado series, and have a decent homestand, you can... Find yourself, depending on how good the homestand is, you might find yourself at near the 500 mark. And as we've tried to show you when we've given you the standings, if you're at 500, and this Willingham's gone on three pitches. 
then you have to consider yourself a contender. Doesn't mean you're going to win anything, but if you're at 500, you're within a good week of maybe a wild card spot. Josh Willingham struggles continue a bit. He's, um, as we see right there, is flying open just a bit. It swings a little bit around the ball instead of right back at it. He, I do believe that Josh will find it. I believe that um, Morales will uh, have a good second half. And, and to your point, Dick, the Twins are starting to pitch very, very well on, on, from their, getting good performances from their starters. And that makes you feel everybody feel better about their, uh, their chance to win and, and how good your team is. I still think this lineup's going to hit at some point in time. You get everybody healthy, you get Santana back and Maurer back, and Morales and Willingham, I think, hit, are going to hit together at some point in time. Then you're their supporting cast with Plouffe and Arcia and Colabello. You've got a chance to be a run producing ball club, and they haven't had a run like that where they really, really killed the ball up and down the lineup. I still think it's possible to have that come. Well, there's RC again and another favorable count three and zero. Oh. We can have two weeks ago three pitches into so many of his at bats the at bat was already over. Three and zero, oh, green lighted and he hits it right to Cano. Two down. Target Field Suites are available for single game rental for groups of 16 to 96. Choose from the intimate premier suites, the flexible event suites, or the spacious skyline suite at Target Field. Food and beverage is included in every purchase. You can find out more at twinsbaseball.com slash groups or call 800-33-TWIN. Schedule your suite at a Twins game. Two down, here's Trevor Plouffe. Dropped down to seventh in the batting order. And a strike at the knees. The ball last night, another called strike. Put it out to the warning track and left, and I asked him today whether he thought he got it. He goes, No. He got in on the trademark just a little bit. Looked good leaving the home plate, but it died on the warning track. And Will helps it breezes through the twins in the second, picking up a couple of strikeouts along the way. To pick him off first base to uh, take him off the bases. Face just three men in the first inning. Now Seeger will lead off the second, be followed by Corey Hart and Logan Morrison. Seeger, a worthy addition to the All Star team for the American League, and we're sorry to report Justin Morneau 
will not uh, at least right now be added uh, to the National League All Star team. He lost out on the fan vote. Anthony Rizzo of the Cubs. White Sox Chris Sale and the Cubs Rizzo won the uh, fan votes. You want to make your own Chicago I was just voting say, joke? You can. <laughs> I was just going to say it sounds a little to me like uh, good old Chicago. Wallop to right. Wrong to nothing. Fourteenth home run of the year for Kyle Seeger. His sixtieth run batted in. And now the Mariners have scored four runs in this series on three solo home runs and a sacrifice slot. Talk about command. Got behind 2-0 and and then came in high and over the middle of the plate. Seager with his 14th home run, as Dick mentioned. All 14 of them coming against right-handed pitchers, and he juiced that one pretty pretty well right there. It's been fun to watch Kyle Seager grow up as a big league hitter. I, I like this young man three or four years ago when I first uh, saw him. He's gotten better every year, and now he's an all-star. For, we just saw a good reason why. 1-0 to Corey Hart. Swinging a foul, one and one. Saw so Johan Pino then kind of throw his head back in uh, somewhat disgust, I think, when he uh, threw that pitch. Corey Hart swung through it, but it was an 88 mile an hour fastball up around stomach high or somewhere where that Pino does not want to pitch. He wasn't happy with it. Got away with one there. Fouled into the seats, and it's one and two. Hart spent some time on the disabled list. And we mentioned, uh, I think, over the course of the earlier broadcast here from Seattle. Hart strikes out. The Mariners feel that they are too left handed and they need some right handed help. And if Hart could start swinging it, that would help them out a great deal. One down. Here's a breaking ball I was talking about earlier, and Hart had not seen it yet. Hadn't seen Pino before and just kind of uh, waved at something, assuming fastball. And his body was and hands were on fastball speed and, and straightness, and it was uh, slower and bendier. <laughs> bendier. Bendier. Here's Logan Morrison, one of the left handed batters the uh, Mariners have in their lineup on a daily basis. And Pino tried to hit that low and inside corner, but missed again. Ball one. The good news is that for the most part when he's tried to come inside he's he has missed but missed in and not over the plate. Snap to the right side. Harmon scoops it up. Pino to the bag. Two down. Now time for you to tweet your photo using hashtag North fan photo for a chance to have it shown in an upcoming twins broadcast brought to you by AT&T. Hope you enjoyed the 1965 All Star Game rebroadcast uh, earlier today. Wasn't able to watch it, but I strongly suspect the National League won again. <laughs> and leadoff man Willie Mays had a pretty good game. Saunders, the batter, is having a good season series against the Twins, hitting 500 against them this year. And Pino starts him up high. Overall, good numbers. Two them. You talked about the Mariners' need for right hand hitting, and I agree they do need some uh, right hand help. Corey Hart could be that person, but I, I think that they're a player or two, uh, a hitter or two away from being a really good and viable division contender. I don't think they get quite enough uh, offense from the corner outfield positions and, and uh, the DH. And possibly first base. And we haven't seen Morrison a lot. Logan Morrison there now. Maybe he'll be the guy. Down the middle of the strike. But so far from first base and left field and in uh, DH, where in the American League you have to have some run production, the Mariners haven't gotten a lot. And right over the back of Pino into center field for the two on single. And that'll bring up Zanino. 
Mariners have played one more game than the Twins have scored eight fewer runs. Coming into play today. Zanino the catcher. Didn't uh, finish the ball game last night but he started all four games behind the plate for the Mariners. Swing and a dribbler foul, one strike. As most managers will do, Lloyd McClendon last night in an eight to one ball game gets uh, gets his everyday catcher out of there, give him a little extra rest. This guy's going to catch an awful lot of games, Mike you know, for uh, McClendon and the Mariners. And he's a good defensive catcher, has the ability to hit the ball out of the ballpark. So he'll he'll rest him when he when he feels like he he has the opportunity. Deep down the left field line, but hooking. Foul. Two strikes. That's the other ability that Zanino has. He's not an accomplished hitter for average yet, but he can hit the ball out of the ballpark. 13 home runs this year. Good defensive catcher with the ability to hit the ball out of the ballpark. That's a valuable commodity, but he's gonna he's gonna have to not he's gonna have to learn how not to strike out 200 times in here, which is kind of the pace he's on right now. Already a struck lot of out 94 yeah, times. That's 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 a lot. 95 times and 259 at bats. The inning starts with a Kyle Seeger home run, and the Mariners take the first lead, one nothing. Link, your link to what's next. By Northland Ford. Visit NorthlandFord.com and your local Northland Ford dealers today. And by Grand Casino. The best stories start here. Tom Wilhelmson looks like he's going to give Lloyd McClendon three innings anyway. That's his max in terms of innings pitch. A season high 52 pitches thrown. That was just in an inning and two thirds back in May against the Astros. Walked four guys in that game. Eduardo Escobar will lead off the third. And the first pitch lifted foul back into the seats. One strike. Well, he's into his third inning. He's only thrown 28 pitches. I was going to ask you if you're on a Lloyd McClendon handstand watch here. And... <laughs> Well, if he could possibly give them four in. <laughs> oh, and you're going to change it to four now to see the handstand. One strike, and Escobar takes a breaking ball strike, too. Well, Helmson walked Suzuki, fell behind Arce at 3 0, but then the Twins green lighted him, and Arce grounded out to short, uh, to second base, rather. And outside one and two.
Escobar fold and Dozier in the Twins third. And he went after a pitch in the dirt. Tagged out. Escobar strikes out. And Wilhelmson has struck out three of the last four batters. Saturday, a full day of MLB action, beginning with the Twins taking on the Rockies on Fox Sports North, and then the Cardinals taking on the Brewers on Fox Sports One. Then it's baseball night in America on Fox as Andrew McCutcheon and the Pirates battle the Reds. The MLB doubleheader begins Saturday at 2:30 p.m. Central on Fox Sports North and Fox Sports One, continuing at six o'clock on Fox and streaming live on Fox Sports Go. Ball one to Sam Fold. We might have told you that. It would be uh, Yadier Molina in the Cardinals taking on the Brewers, but Molina is going to have thumb surgery, I believe, tomorrow, and the Cardinals are going to be without their all star catcher for roughly, it would take a couple of weeks now, but roughly two months. I cannot imagine a worse possible loss for that ball club than the Cardinals trying to catch the Brewers and be without Yadier Molina. Cole takes over the inside corner, two and one. Sanford Health injury, injury report. Uh, he tore a ligament in his right thumb. Of course, that's his throwing thumb, and he did it sliding feet first into a base. A high third three ball count for Wilhelm. Slid into third base, but banged his thumb into the ground as, as he was stopping himself and, and uh, tore those ligaments. Good hitting catcher. Shuts down the running game. Just a terrific play. And full tank, so one out walk. Well, there are some catchers out there. John Buck designated for assignment here by the Mariners after Monday's game. A.J. Pierzynski's uh, realizing a similar fate from the Red Sox yesterday. We'll see what the Twins do, if anything, with Sam Fold. Fold has now reached base seven of his last eight plate appearances. Dozier hit a ground ball to Cano behind the second base bag. This is the situation we saw last night. With fold at first, Dozier at the plate, and the Mariners swung over to the pull side. Dozier has virtually the entire right side of the infield open to him. And even with a runner at first, and Morris in the first baseman holding the runner, Cano is still on the other side of second base. One strike to Dozier. And missed two strikes. Well, there's a reason why they're playing them over there. I mean, the charts and graphs that every team uh, has on uh, opposing hitters will show that Brian just doesn't hit the ball on the ground to the right side. But you're right. He's got 90 feet. He's got more than 90 feet of open space uh, between first and second base. Foul to the backstop. Still two strikes. Brian has a terrific ability to pull the ball and pull the ball with authority. He's got 16 home runs, all, all of them to left field, I believe. Very, very quick on the ball from the middle end. Likes to, likes to hit the fastball and pulls it. He just doesn't hit ground balls to the right side. Back to the back. See 60 or 59 hits to the left, 16 up in the middle or up the middle, and then just five of them hit to the opposite field. And I guarantee you, those five were none of, none of which none of them were on the ground. They were all line drives and fly balls. It's a rather defensive swing, but he got the bat on the ball to keep the at bat alive. Yeah, that's an emergency <laughs> swing right there. <laughs> you ever you ever hear the sound of the when the submarines are you, they play that horn and they, when they yeah. dive when they dive that's that was going off in the hitter's head. Yeah, hey, how about that? That's base beautiful. hit to right field. That is beautiful. With two strikes, Dozier hit it right where Cano would have been in a normal defensive alignment. Now first and second one down for Kurt Suzuki. Brian's laughing. He said, I never hit it over there. But you know, I have to tell you something. If you're going to play the second base behind second, you ought not throw the ball in the outside corner with <laughs> two strikes. Right. And he's got a chance to hit it over there. But boy, it, that was right at where Cano plays. You're right. And 
That's a beautiful little base hit right there. And now the tying run of speedy runner and Sam Fold at second base. And Suzuki at the plate. Had a great battle with Wilhelmson, drew a one out walk. The RBIs have been slower to come for Suzuki after the first two months, but for the longest time he was right up there with Dozier, and now Rick Waits is going to come to the mound to talk to Wilhelmson. But through it all, throughout his first half with the Twins, he's been one of their better clutch hitters. Quick trip to the mound by the Mariner pitching coach. First two months of the season, it was like he drove, Kurt Suzuki drove in every run he looked at out there. He was as Clutch a hitter as there was in the league for for a pretty good stretch of time. First at bat tonight, he had as we look at Danny Farquhar warming up. Will Hampson starting to uh, approach the uh, pitch count that McClendon has laid out. Fifty, no more than 60. 50 would be uh, more desirable. He's at 42 now, so and losing a little bit of command. So Lloyd McClendon getting a relief pitcher up. Suzuki cuts through it. I was about to say that the uh, well, here, look at this point of contact for uh, Brian Dozier. That's a classic hitting the ball the other way. Back on the plate, ball outside, lets it get deep and over the plate, gets the big end of the bat on it, lines it to the right. That's that's a classic right field stroke right there. Good hitting. One and one to Suzuki. And the runners go. Pitch inside the ball thrown into left field. Fold will score. Dozier to third. And the Twins tie it up by running the bases aggressively. And Zanino firing the ball into the left field corner. He's throwing the shitter. A double steal here in the third inning. Manager Ron Garden hired mentioned that he was going to try to be aggressive this series, try to get some offense going. He's run Sam Fold a lot. A rare double steal attempt here, but really, really pays off. And now three and one to Suzuki. And in the third inning, the Mariners will bring the infield in in a tie ball game. Suzuki swings and misses three and two. And this, of course, speaks to the Mariners' inability to. Score many runs right now. You're in the third inning in a 1 1 game, and you're bringing the infield in. It's exactly right. They, manager Lloyd McClendon not wanting to give the Twins any easy runs, going to try to make them earn all of them because his offense just isn't, isn't scoring any runs at all. Suzuki back to the backstop. Carsoup.com trivia question all time. Which Twins player has the most career RBIs against the Mariners? With a background shot of Tom Bernanski. That I am sure is intended to mislead you. <laughs> well, I have some uh, pretty vivid memories of Gary Gaetti absolutely destroying Floyd Bannister and uh, mm -hmm. some of the left handers. It, it, it could be the rat. Because he hit the Mariners very well. Suzuki with another really grinding out tough at bat right here. His first one was a classic Suzuki at bat and then walk. And this is exactly what he does. He's a great pitch spoiler. He's mad at himself right there because he felt like he got a hit a pitch he could hit and uh, wanted to uh, at least drive that to the outfield to, to uh, score Dozier. Second uh, time in a row before the pitch. Dale Scott's trying to get everybody's attention. Tell them that the count is as you see in the screen two and two and not three and two as was on the scoreboard. And a high fly to center. Dozier setting up for a tag and Jones with the catch. Here comes Dozier and the throw to the plate. Good in time. Dozier got his hand on the plate and the fly ball just deep enough to put the twins in front. Pretty strong throw by James Jones. Brian Dozier's a good runner, run fast, and made a terrific slide to get the run in for Kurt Suzuki.
Jones does a good job of staying behind the ball and gets all his momentum going toward the plate. That's about as much as a center fielder can do on a fly ball right there. The ball did short hop Zanino a little bit. If it had been a longer hop or all the way in the air, it might have been an easier tag for him. Parmalee takes outside. But the Twins will take it, and another really, really good grinded out at bat by Kurt Suzuki. 50 pitches for Wilhelmson. And almost predictably, he's run into trouble here in the third inning. If you look at his appearances this year, and they have been mainly an inning or a fraction of an inning, four times he's pitched three innings. To make that three times and now down and in. I just find the whole decision making process <laughs> curious. I, I honestly do. I, I like Lloyd McClendon, <laughs> but we've talked about this really since uh, we started on this road trip. Pitches up. The decision was considered, pondered for two, three weeks. They were looking ahead. And they knew that Felix Hernandez was only going to make one start this week before the All-Star break. And it was a question of where he would start. And in giving him an extra day, that's fine. But rather than call someone up from the minor leagues, a starter, you're essentially almost turning this into, well, Chris Parmalee said it's like a spring training game. You're going to face roughly a different pitcher every time up. But I mean, even within that, it's an early spring training game. Three and two. Harmony takes ball four. And now Lloyd McClendon's got to come out and he won't be doing a handstand because Wilhelmson is not going to be able to complete three innings. In the course of a 162 game season, every game weighs the same, do they not? Well, here's, the, here's how they don't, and this is what confuses me. I actually understand the decision in this way. If Hernandez pitches, and as we see the pitching change, maybe we'll uh, continue yeah. this conversation yeah. uh, afterwards because it's going to take a while to explain this one. Okay. <laughs> Runners, Danny Farquhar is warming up, and uh, you'll look at Farquhar's numbers, and we'll begin Roy Smalley's dissertation. As to <laughs> why? Well, you want to know why, Lloyd? I, here's <laughs> here's the deal. King Felix could pitch against the uh, the Twins tonight, and they could win or they could lose, but it may or may they may or may not gain a game or lose a game against Oakland because it depends on what Oakland does. Right, right. So they move him back to pitch against Oakland if they're trying to catch Oakland. They know if they beat Oakland, they gain a game on the team that's in, in first place. So I understand them moving moving back. What I don't understand, as Farquhar pitches to Kendrick Morales here, low ball one. What I don't understand is I'm starting to hear kind of scuttlebutt about, well, don't know if we can catch Oakland, but we're sure in the wild card hunt. Then your point's the right one. All 162 games are of equal importance if you're in the wild card hunt. Morales blasts one to right. 
And Saunders reaches up and pulls it in on the warning track. The inning ends. The Twins with a couple of stolen bases and a couple of runs. And Kyle Seeger blasting a home run off Johan Pino to give the Mariners a 1 0 lead. But Will Helmson started off strong the first two innings, throwing the ball by guys and then ran into trouble in the Twins' third. Two guys on. Mike Zanino would throw the ball in the left field on a double steal, allowing Sam Fold to score and Dozier go to third. And then Kurt Suzuki, nice sacrifice fly, a nice slide by Brian Dozier, and the Twins have a 2 1 lead. And Pino. Hits the outside corner with his first pitch, one strike. It'll be Willie Bloomquist, Andy Chavez, and James Jones in the Mariner third. Up the middle and a base hit. Bloomquist gets the fourth Mariner hit, first time through the batting order against Johan Pino. We talked about the fact that good starting pitching will really make a team feel good about itself. You know what else will? Really sparkling defense. You get pitchers pitching well and guys throwing the leather at you out there. That will really, really help a team's confidence, especially when they're not swinging the bats real well. And we've seen the Twins do that here most of the season. Play really, really good defense, especially where they've been, where their position players are pretty solidified. Roof in on the grass at third. Pino delivers strike one. Chavez hit a fly ball to right his first time up. And one on one. You know, given a lead now, he has pitched with a lead very often. One and one to the Mariner left fielder. And a strike on the outside corner. Mentioned the Twins have already won the season series with Seattle, and as left handed as they are, the Twins uh, don't have a left handed starting pitcher to exploit their left handedness. Popped up short center. In fact, it's still in the infield dirt, and Dozier makes the catch one away. We're talking about great defense. This guy is the leader of the pack right here, Brian Dozier. Plays the ball off of Chris Colabello. Got a funny little hop there, but stayed with it to get Cano. This is a tough hop right there that he stays with. And then how many times have we seen this play? That dive and play on a one-hop smash, it's, it's almost like 
it's whole hump for, for Brian Dozier. And I believe that this young man is playing as good a defense at second base as anybody uh, in the game right now. And with a nod toward Pedroia, I don't see him every day. I see Brian, but I, it's hard for me to imagine anybody playing the position any better, both on routine plays and on really, really good athletic, spectacular plays. 1 and 0 to James Jones, singled in the first, and then eventually was picked off. Not during the Cano at bat, but as Seeger was in the box, on about the sixth or seventh pickoff move, Pino finally got him after the original ruling was challenged. Popped up, fouling out of play, 1 and 1. And so. Pino already having picked off the top B stealing threat for the Mariners in Jones. You wouldn't expect a Bloomquist to take off. One and one. And so there he goes. And the pitch foul to the backstop. One and two. Bloomquist had a good jump. Twins two runs were ignited by a double steal. And now Lloyd McClendon trying to get the tying run into scoring position with a stolen base as well. Yeah, I think that was uh, that might have been a hit and run uh, uh, play right there as, as much as a straight steal. I think that he believes that Jones can uh, handle the bat a little bit, especially against a guy like Johan Pino that doesn't have an overpowering fastball. I don't think he thinks that there's anything that he's going to throw up there that. Jones, Jones, Jones could get some, make some contact with, and Pino almost, you're right, almost got him there on that ball in the outside corner. Two and two. Mariners out hitting the Twins four to one, but they out hit them in the ball game last night. Ball back. Pino has retired six batters and already approaching the 50 pitch mark. And another 2 2 to Jones. Fly ball center field. It almost right at Sam Fold for the second out. And that'll bring up Robinson Cano. Twin season ticket holders enjoy 10% off concessions and merchandise at Target Field all season long. 2014 season tickets remain available for what's hoping to be a fun summer with beautiful weather at Target Field. Call 833 Twins or visit twinsbaseball.com. You still have time to join the Twins season ticket family. Cano with a fly ball to center his first time up. to second base holding Cano to a single but more importantly holding Bloomquist at third good retrieve by Arcia who had the benefit of getting a long rebound from the wall very nice play by Oswaldo Arcia that looked like a double uh, all the way he did get a nice a nice bounce and here's that beautiful stroke of Cano went up there looking for a fastball got one in the middle of the plate and hammered it to right field but you watch this ball come off the wall well, one hop to uh, Arcia, and I think the really good play there is Arcia recognizing that he got to that ball in a hurry and that Bloomquist probably was not going to be able to score. So keep Cano on first, off a of second base on first. If he had thrown to a cutoff man set up for home, Cano might have gone to second base. So nice play by Arcia. Up and in to Seeger, who hit a home run, his 14th of the year, leading off the second inning. Five Mariner hits in the first 12 plate appearances. Fouled away, one and one. Good 
Lundquist led off the third inning with a single, now standing at third with Cano across the way at first. Side corner one and two. You think Kurt Suzuki and Johan Pino caught Kyle Seeger uh, guessing a little bit there? Hard for me to imagine him taking a uh, high 80 mile an hour fastball down the middle with guys out there on on the bases. I think they're kind of looking for something off speed. One and two. Missing low. Seeger's fourth year with the Mariners back in 2011, just 182 at bats, just under 600 at bats in 2012, just over 600 at bats last year. And on a pace to drive in in the neighborhood of 100 runs. Two and two to the Mariner third baseman. Nice block by Suzuki. The count's full with Corey Hart on deck. A base open, but it's second base. Seeger laid off a breaking pitch in the dirt. One of the things that the three starters that have pitched the first three games for the Twins have been able to had been able to do or did did do is be able to make really big pitches in situations like this. They let allowed get some guys to get on. Mariners got some singles, but then when they had to make a pitch, they made one. I won't mention it again. In the last four ball games, not counting today, the Mariners are one for 30 with runners in scoring position. Another 3 2 pitch to Kyle Seeger. And another foul ball. On these 3 2 pitches, of course, Cano taking off from first base. Every team goes through it, but the Mariners are the team going through it most visibly now. It's such a wilting experience. When your team doesn't have a whole lot of power and you can't hit with men in scoring position or haven't been. So this is a other than the situation that exists here in the third. This is a pretty big plate appearance here for the Mariners. They've got their top RBI guy at the plate trying to wake the team up a little bit. Another foul ball. Pino's thrown him just about everything he's got. Fastballs on both sides of the plate and, and the breaking ball. Seeger hanging in there pretty tough. He is their best RBI guy and he's done most of his damage at home against right handed pitching. Theoretically, he's in a pretty good spot here. To see if Pino can make a pitch. Looks like they're going. Sinker on the outside corner, see if we can hit that. Get it out there. And he missed. So now the bases are loaded for Corey Hart. <laughs> and Suzuki out to the mound, and Rick Anderson right behind him. Corey Hart struck out in the second. Everybody in the infield on the mound. See Rick Anderson talking to uh, Johan Pino, and he's, he's nodding his head. I'm, I'm pretty sure that you know Rick Anderson, such a positive guy, and it's, it works has such good rapport. You see Suzuki patting him on the back. I'm pretty sure that that body language amongst all concerned there is Rick Anderson saying, "Look, you're one really good pitch away from getting out of this inning. I know you got the bases loaded. I know you only have a one-run lead, but your stuff is good. You're throwing the ball." Where you want to throw it for the most part, you're only one really good pitch get, uh, get away from getting out of this. 
Let's go make that pitch right now. 36 strikes among the 57 pitches. Breaking ball over for strike one. Hart didn't play at all last year because of injuries. Just jumped back into the lineup less than a week ago after spending some more time on the disabled list. What a stop by Suzuki. That ball landed right in the middle of the left handed batter's box. Okay, all young catchers, watch this. Watch the quickness with which he moves out to get his whole body in front of it, and then he's got really, really nice hands. He, most catchers would just make sure that they were going to block that ball with their chest protector, but Kurt's got a very, very nice feel with that glove on his hand. One and one. And another breaking ball wide, two and one. So you'd like to think that Pino can get out of this inning. And you uh, might be tempted to bookmark this at bat, but within it, bookmark that pitch that was scooped out of the dirt, keeping Bloomquist at third base. Two and one now to Corey Hart. Breaking ball hits the outside corner. Four curves in a row to Corey Hart. Two of them for strikes and two of them well off the plate. That last one was a pitcher's pitch, and it's frustrating for a hitter. You saw a little frustrated look on Corey Hart. He looks like he has no command with the breaking ball, and he throws it right on the corner. Do it again. Fastball. A little foul toward Andy Van Slyke. Sixty two pitches for Pino in the game. Two and two to Hart. Just off the plate. This will be the 30th pitch this inning. Tried to hit the outside corner with a fastball. You see Kurt sliding his body in toward the middle of the plate, trying to. Convince the umpire, but it was just just out, and it was a big pitch. They'll all be running. Struck him out. An off-speed pitch up across the letters, and Hart strikes out, leaving the bases full. And the Mariners are now one for 31 with runners in scoring position, and the Twins still lead by one. Hart, but he left the bases full. The Twins still have a two to one lead. 
And now Josh Willingham, Oswaldo Arce, and Trevor Plouffe will hit against Danny Farquhar. The supposed order of relievers tonight was going to include Brandon Maurer, but he had to be used in yesterday's game, so Farquhar moved up a notch. And Willingham pops the first pitch up to the right side. And it's Cano with the catch, one away. Huge at bat last inning with the bases loaded for Johan Pino. Starts Corey Hart with a breaking ball for a strike, then throws two breaking balls in a row. Not even close. Kurt Suzuki making his spectacular stop on one, then throws a nasty pitch on the corner. Now he's got two and two. Pretty good pitch that Cart Hart barely fouls off, misses outside, three and two, and throws a hanging breaking ball that he got away with. Hart can't believe he missed it. Inside to RC, a ball one. I think right there in that situation, this happens to hitters a lot. You finally you work and you work and you work and you get the count to three and two. And in the back of your mind creeps in, okay, now I get a fastball, three and two. Cano snags the first hop. How much of that can be attributed, not because of the outcome, but because of the sequence of pitches can you uh, credit uh, Kurt Suzuki for? Here, Pino, with the bases loaded, there's no place to put Hart. And he threw almost two wild breaking balls. One of them saved nicely by Suzuki, and he came back with a fourth straight breaking ball and he happened to hit the corner with it. I mean, not many catchers would call four straight breaking balls to begin with. But then, I mean, the pitch number two and pitch number three weren't close to being strikes. <laughs> two down. Loof takes a strike. One of the things that I think Kurt Suzuki does so well is work with his pitcher and work the plan. And I think the plan there was to get Hart on breaking balls and uh, Kurt just wasn't going to give in. He was going to make his pitcher throw that pitch could be, and continue to throw it until they got him because he thought that was the best way to get him out. And if they walk him, they, they uh, walk him. But a pitcher has got to be able to throw that pitch over. If that's the way they think they can get hard out, he's got to throw it over. And, and Kurt's attitude is if you can't do it, we're not going to win anyway. So, you know, you're not going to get him anyway. So let's go. You've got to throw it. Come on. Now he's got you got to throw it over. Standing out there in the mound, you've just about thrown one to the backstop and the other one not within a foot of being a strike. And the catcher puts down two fingers again. It's like, oh, wait a minute. And yet, that one skips under Cano's glove. He kind of laid that one and proof would be aboard with two away. And yet, he did throw two of them uh, very wildly, but he threw two perfect ones too yeah, right on the that. outside corner. So, you know, you, you're not sure what you're going to get, but you know what you want to get. Trevor hits this ball really, really sharply and it didn't look like Robinson Cano's heart was really in this one <laughs> this play if you watch now I know he's nonchalant and he can and that's a tough play but I don't think he wanted a whole lot to do with that Bluff at first two away and now Eduardo Escobar Escobar's average down to 259 been uh, struggling to find his swing here over the last several weeks and he takes a strike at the knees. You know I've watched uh, Eduardo Escobar a lot here in, in this uh, this season when he started uh, for the first time really uh, in his major league career getting a chance to play and hitting the ball well and mechanically it, it, it as it happens so often sometimes our greatest strengths are uh, can also be weaknesses. He has such great leg drive that's where, why a little guy like he is can generate some power, but that also gets him in trouble because that leg drive will force his head to come forward with, with his legs uh, driving. And once your head's moving forward as a hitter, it's very, very difficult to get the bat head out in front in a position where it's supposed to be. And I think that's what he's struggling with here a little bit, finding the, the timing between good leg drive but staying behind the ball with his head. One and two. The bouncer right side. Easier play for Cano, and that takes care of the Twins in the fourth inning. Stay tuned for this important message from Mesh Besher and Spence.
Friends, Fox Sports Supports is proud to collaborate with Stand Up to Cancer, a groundbreaking initiative created to accelerate innovative cancer research that gets new therapies to patients quickly in order to save lives now. For more information, visit foxsportsupports.com. Johan Pino could use an easy inning. He really struggled in each of the last two innings and struggled a little bit in the first inning. And he delivers strike one to Logan Morrison. In Pino's last start against the Yankees, he breezed through four innings, just faced 13 guys, and then struggled in innings five and six. Maybe he's just getting the bad innings out of the way early. Foul back two strikes. Pino has struggled with his command a little bit. He's missed uh, missed the corners that he, with his fastball. Missed the corners he's aiming at with his fastballs, and and uh, hasn't had a real, real effective curveball yet. Although these first two pitches to uh, Morrison have been exactly what he wants to do. Dropped a nice little curveball over for strike one. Had had good break on it, and then a good sinker away to get 0-2. So yes, maybe he'll find a little command here in innings uh, four, five, and six. Two strikes. Another foul ball. Ron Garden hired discussing the Mariner team, and we all know they're struggling to score runs. But I think the word he used was scrappy. But he did describe them as a team that can foul off a lot of pitches, and that's what we've seen happen here tonight. That's one of the reasons why Pino is. Getting close to 70 pitches here already in the ball game. And Morrison's fouled off a few two strike pitches here in this opening at bat of the fourth inning. And that got Suzuki, I think, in the bare hand. You know, trying to get a strikeout pitch here over through the uh, curve ball got uh, Kurt in the uh, left. Upper forearm or uh, in the bicep somewhere, but it got it got meat pretty squarely. That that hurts. And you know a catcher's got to do that with two strikes. He's got to he, he's got to block that pitch or it goes to the screen. And and uh, if the hitter would happen to swing at it, right. It, so it's just one of those where one of those tough pain you have to suck up. You know, two and two fastball missing. You know, retired the leadoff man in the first, but then gave up a leadoff home run in the second and a leadoff single in the third. Dozier with the catch over to Parmalee 101. Devastating news for the Yankees as they diagnose Matsuhiro Tanaka with a partially torn UCL in his pitching elbow. They will try to avoid surgery, but just based on past history, it would seem unlikely that the outstanding rookie pitcher for the Yankees will be able to avoid having Tommy John surgery. At about the same time that diagnosis was made, I was riding up the hotel elevator and I Saw somebody who looked familiar and I, he had a name tag on, and I looked down at the name tag and it said Dr. James Andrews. <laughs> really? And, and so then they, he was having a conversation with a couple of other people who are a lot smarter than I am. And this Dr. James Andrews got off the elevator and I asked the other two gentlemen in the elevator, I said, Is that the Dr. Andrews? And they said, Yes. So I'm glad I wasn't, you know. Flexing my arm or elbow or limping on and off the you elevator. Might have, you might have been taken directly <laughs> to the hospital. He may have <laughs> gone to work on me, but he's here in Seattle, I guess, in a medical conference. One and two to Michael Saunders. Got another hit against the Twins, his last at bat. Before taking your way to uh, surgery, he might have asked you if there was <laughs> any chance at all that you might take the hill against somebody of some kind of import. And, if you'd been honest with him, then probably he would not have uh, offered to uh, to cut you. There's a called third strike, and Pino gets the second out of the fourth inning. And that'll bring up Mike Zanino. 
Well, again, if Pino catches the, uh, Mar a Mariner hitter with a little bit of a brain cramp here and looking for something else and, or something crept into his mind that maybe he's going to throw me that breaking ball again or something because that was not a difficult uh, location of a fastball to take with two strikes. Fox tracks presented by Chrysler. And up an in ball one to Mike Zanino. That's the kind of thing as a hitter you just give away the bat right there because something creeps into the back of your mind. You got two strikes and think, okay, he might throw me a breaking ball, and then, some, and then the pitcher zips a fastball in there that you could really nail. And all you can do is watch it go by for strike three. One and one to Zanino. And Pino is one good pitch away from having that easy inning. One and two. Red Sox walked off the White Sox. Cleveland shelled the Yankees. Detroit really shelled the Royals 16 to 4. Lifted to center. Fold calling for it. Right in front of RC. He makes the catch, and Pino has his 1 2 3 inning. Pepsi fans of the game all the way from St. Paul to support the Twins. And again today, the weather's been so beautiful. I think everybody traveling with the Twins has been out walking around Seattle and just enjoying the glorious weather here. And Twins caps and t shirts and not many sweatshirts because it's been so warm. But a lot of Twins fans here. There are a lot of Twins fans, and glorious is a great word for the way the weather's been for us here. Just spectacular. What a beautiful, beautiful city this is. Really, in any weather conditions, but when you can see it like you're mm -hmm. like we're seeing it in this trip, it's just spectacular. Fold takes it's two and one. The water just beautifully blue with the clear skies and everything right. that should be green here is green. Right. Two and one to Sam Fold. And another. Time on base for Sam Fold. He's now reached an eight of his last nine plate appearances. Lead off single here in the fifth. Drew a walk. Ended up scoring in the third inning. Now a lead off single. Sam just continues to make good co solid contact. He's been working very very hard with hitting coach Tom Rudansky. The Really, really paying off. He's feeling very, very good about his swing right now, and it shows. He's 
He's getting the barrel of the bat to the ball consistently. See how Ron Gardenhire plays it here uh, now with a uh, one run lead. Needing to get some more runs. He's got some speed on first and Sam Fold. He's got a guy that can handle the bat a little bit and Brian Dozier. I know Guardy wants to be aggressive on the bases here this series and see how he how he plays this one. Mariners aren't shifted as extremely as they were in Dozier's first two at bats. Now they say that eventually things even up. Dozier in the first inning hit one right over the pitcher rubber and right over second base and Cano was standing there. And so he had a hit taken away by the shift in the first. But then in the third inning he had a line drive right where a second baseman would normally be standing. Going in the foul two and one. And so in Dozier's first two at bats they have evened up. I don't think they ever really even out. Yeah, I knew that. You were going to say that. <laughs> well, it, you, uh, it's just because there's a lot of guys standing out there in the way of the ball when you hit it. But, but they do. The even out is not 50-50. But it, over the course of the season, if you're putting good swings on the ball, the number of line drives that are caught and the times that guys are standing in front of it, you'll get your share of, uh, of some uh, some oop space hits as well. And I think uh, <laughs> there is a. Guy said to me one time, Rick Sarone with the Yankees said, "You know, the only difference between great hitters and and the rest of us is they're just luckier." Pop up short right center field, Cano with his back to the infield and running in to make the catch and avoiding a collision is Michael Saunders. That's a fine play by Michael Saunders. That's not an easy play when you're anticipating a possible collision with the franchise there at second base. So he has to run in, keep his concentration on the ball, call Cano off, and catch it side saddle right in front of Robinson Cano. Look at that concentrate. Oop, he looked away from it a little bit, to, but uh, he had the concentration long enough to be able to get the glove where the ball was going to be. It's a nice play. And just to finish the thought, I think just think it was so it was it, it was a kind of a ridiculous comment because the good hitters are are just they are luckier because they put better swings on more pitches and, and the ball c comes out in in uh, areas where there aren't any fielders but it doesn't even out but the better swings you put on it the more uh, the more swings you're going to get with your the more hits you're going to get with your C and D swings one and O to Suzuki. Runner goes, swung on a missed, and now Fold will try to get back or at least get hung up in a rundown, and he'll be tagged out. Fold took off, and when Suzuki swung through it, that was the end of Fold's pursuit of second base. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm kind of looking for a hit and run from Gardy here with a guy at the plate in Suzuki that can handle the bat, and, and Fold did not have a great jump. That was a hit and run kind of jump. They're, everybody fully expecting. Kurt to be able to make some kind of contact with the ball and he just wasn't able to do it that time on that hit and run. That was not a steal second base jump. That was a make absolutely sure the guy's going home here because I know my hitter can make contact with it. He just didn't do it. And Suzuki drills one to center on the next pitch. And that'll bring up Chris Parmalee. Parmalee with a walk and a line out to right. A little bit unlucky there for Ron Gardenhire and Kurt Suzuki. It was a good hit and run uh, pitch and, and count. He had the right guys out there. And Farquhar just made a really nasty pitch, a hard sinker that was sinking down into to Kurt. He just couldn't get his bat on it. And Park, uh, Parmalee spanks one the other way. Three singles in the inning. And Morales will come up with two men aboard. Morales with a bouncer to short and a liner to right field. Yeah, he hit that ball to right field very, very hard in the third inning. And we mentioned in the uh, in the pregame show and also in the open to our uh, game broadcast here. How much he has been barreling up the ball. He he's been getting the big end of the bat to the ball on a regular basis these uh, these last two games. And it's like Lloyd McClendon's going to make a pitching change with the Twins starting to catch up 
to uh, Farquhar here. The third reliever on a bullpen day for the Mariners will enter the game with runners at first and second and two down. <laughs> Joe Bimel will make Kendris Morales a right handed batter. Joe Bimel, another reliever out in that bullpen for Lloyd McClendon that's uh, pitched very well. It seems like they don't have anybody out there that hasn't. And you're right, Dick. This is a turn uh, Kendris Morales around to the right side. Morales, a slightly better hitter, left handed throughout his career, has been much better this year. Early in his uh, in, in his season, uh, back from uh, from having been out for quite a while, he's been much better left-handed. They're not uh, they're not great numbers, but there's a pretty big split between the two, and he's hit the ball harder even in his outs, left-handed than right-handed. So McClendon going out trying to stop the bleeding here in this inning by getting Morales to his at least so far weaker side. The one home run that Morales has was from this side of the plate. We'll see whether Morales, who's been stinging the ball in this series, can get the fourth hit of this inning. Down the way, ball one. A really big two out hit last night. It was in the first inning when the Twins yep. had uh, Dozier uh, leading off the game with a double, and two outs later he was still at second base. And that's why it was such a big hit, not only to get the first run, but to kind of pick up uh, Eduardo Nunez, who failed to get Dozier over from second to third with nobody out. And Zanino with a nice stop. 2-0. You know, those things are never highlighted. Catching blocks are never highlighted in uh, great fielding clips that you see on TV, but we've already seen Suzuki's great stop couple innings ago was the key play of that inning in keeping the Mariners off the scoreboard. Now we'll see how significant Zanino's block is here. 2 and 0. And hard to center. And that ball is going to get over the head of Jones. Suzuki will score. Hermely around third. He will try to score. And he will with Zanino fanning on the throw. Another ringing double for Kendris Morales and two more runs batted in. Another line shot that fooled uh, center fielder uh, James Jones because he, Kendris just tattooed this ball and it just never ever came down. Jones with a late break back. It looked like he thought he had a beat on it the whole way, and the ball just kind of jetted over his head. That ball was hammered. And again, we said two days ago that it looked to, to, to me like Kendrys Morales was starting to feel like uh, he wants to feel, like he's felt his whole life with a bat in his hand. And for three games in a row now, he's done nothing but 
hit the ball on the barrel of the bat. And that is, this is one strong man. I'm going to tell you, I've watched him in batting practice with, with Bruno. It's almost scary how hard he can hit the ball. We saw an example of it right there. So they'll walk Josh Willingham to uh, with first base open here. And Arcia will hit against the lefty. And this is the, the type of hit. And we'll take a look at the relay to play to see what happened with the throw. I'm not sure what happened there to Zanino. He was in front of the plate. He just missed the catch. Had he caught the ball, they might have had Harmony. Yeah, the ball bounced right a little bit off the grass. It was a nice throw by uh, Cano, but the ball bounced right. And it looked like he was trying to stay in position to make the tag rather than going out and getting the ball. Outside the RC, a ball one. And he he probably made the right decision. If he had moved even at all a little bit to go get that throw, then uh, Parmley's probably safe easily. He had, probably had to hold his position and, and make a really, really good snag of that throw to have any chance of getting him. Well, and I wonder whether the new catcher's mandate, too, entered into Zanino's. If you're not as free to move, move around at home plate as you used to be. You've got to give the runner the sliding lane. He can move laterally up the line, but if he moves back at all and blocks the plate without the ball, then Parmley is going to be ruled safe anyway. Right, and that's my point. The only way he could have caught the ball and made that tag would have been to move directly into the line. And if he moved up the line a little bit so he could have caught it, Parmley slides by him pretty easily. So I think he just decided, i got to stay here where I've got the best chance of tag and just hope I can snag that throw and he couldn't do it. 2-0 to Arcia. Chop to the right side. Easy play for Morrison. But the Twins get a big two-run double from Kendris Morales. And now lead the Mariners 4-1. to one. Fans, don't forget at Twins home games, bring your circle me signs, and if you get circled, you may find yourself in the Minnesota Lottery Winner Circle, where you could win $100 worth of lottery scratch off tickets, courtesy of the Minnesota Lottery. And now Willie Bloomquist will lead off the fifth for Seattle. And a strike. Significant for Pino because he's never. Had a lead survive past the next half inning as a big leaguer. Twins gave him a two to one lead in the uh, top of the third inning. And while it wasn't pretty, he got through the third and held on to the lead. That's the first time he's held on to a big league lead. And now on the fourth, he had a one, two, three inning. He'll face Bloomquist, Chavez, and Jones in the fifth, with the lead having grown now to three runs. A fly ball to right field. And Arcia comes in to put it away. One down. To that point, Dick, I will just tell you that that double driving in two runs by 
Kendrys Morales there in the top of this inning. Just a gigantic hit for a number of reasons. First of all, we know that the Twins themselves have not been uh, phenomenal at, at uh, hitting with runners in scoring position. They were especially with two out. Two guys on. Morales scores them both with uh, two out. And, and that in and of itself is big. But to give this young man a three-run lead going into the inning where if he gets through, he gets his, his, he has a potential to have his first major league win. What a big load off of his shoulders to have a three-run lead rather than a one-run lead when he's trying to get through the the fifth inning to get a win here. Dozier won't be able to pull it down, and Chavez has his first hit, a one-out single in the fifth. Because of the exhausting third inning, Pino's at 85 pitches, but that double might uh, rewind his arm about 20 pitches. It might <laughs> yeah. seem more like 65. Yeah. And now James Jones with a runner at first and one out. It can be really tough for a young pitcher that hasn't had a lot of wins, especially as someone that hasn't had any at the in the major leagues to get through that fifth inning. This is a this is a tough inning for for young pitchers. Oftentimes, see how Pino can do it. There's a real good pitch right there on the outside corner. Jones with a single. Pino picked him off in the first, and then a fly ball to center. Retired five men in a row, a couple of them on strikeouts. And again, just one ground ball double play on a big league mound. Nice catch by Suzuki, one and one. Especially considering he was setting up for the pitch on the inside corner and the ball was in the other batter's box. Up, Loof retreating, and making the catch out number two. And it'll bring up Cano. Same player, different uniform, and a different number. They had a number 24 here that no one will ever wear again. Mr. Griffey. Chavez still at first now with two down. And Cano one for two. Big out there to get Jones. Had get Cano up there, not representing the tying run here in the fifth inning. Down low ball one. That pitch a lot there to Cano come up hard up and in, back him off a little bit. I would like it better if it was 0-1 when he made that pitch, make it one to one, but still you have to you have to impress good hitters that you might be coming up in there hard. Make them just a little bit more uncomfortable so you can go back outside. And Cano spanks the center to center. Chavez will hold up at center. And that'll get Seeger to the plate representing the tying run. You see Kurt Suzuki going down and away and Pino up and in the middle of the zone just couldn't get it down there where he wanted and Cano's not going to miss that pitch an awful lot. Lucky that's a that's a single and not something a little bit more aggressive. Suzuki out on the mound trying to encourage one more out out of Pino. And here is Seeger again with two men aboard. He came up in this spot in the third inning and eventually, with second base open, drew a walk to fill the bases. And then Pino ended up striking out Corey Hart. Low ball one.
And the dirt 2 0. The beginnings of activity in the Twins bullpen. Anthony Swarzak warming up. Pino perhaps running out of gas here in the fifth. Breaking ball over two and one. That's a heck of a pitch right there. Not giving in to Kyle Seeger has already hit one fastball in the seats. Two and all fastball count. As you said, Dick, I think he's laboring as well. I think he's starting to run out of gas, but to drop that curveball in there, that's a that's a real good pitch. See if he can finish Seeger. Get that get out of this inning. Two and two. That two and old breaking ball, just enough suggestion he might throw anything at any time to get the hitter just a little bit less aggressive. That's why it was that two and old curveball, such a good pitch. Great call by Suzuki and a good job by Pino actually throwing it for a strike. Showing him Seeger that he can throw it for a strike, even in a two and old type of count, will make him even uh, more defensive here with two strikes. Two and two to Seeger. Full count. Seeger ended up walking with second base open in the third. Here in the fifth, third base is open. Ten years in the minor leagues, and he knows he needs to complete this fifth inning to get a chance for his first big league win. Whatever he's got left, he's going to try to throw it here on three and two. Foul ball at 90. Not far from where he threw the one that Seeger hit over the fence in the second inning. Yeah, and the only difference is that Seeger's a little bit unsure of what he's going to get because of that breaking ball at 2 0 and can't be quite as aggressive. But that's a dangerous pitch up there. He doesn't want to throw it up there again. And you're right. Give it any, everything you have here at, at, right on this pitch to this hitter because I think he's done after this inning. Checked his swing and no swing. It'll be a walk to fill the bases. And Seeger draws his second walk against Pino. And for the second time in as many at bats, Corey Hart comes up with the bases loaded and two out. And the message from Rick Anderson right here is going to be much the same as it was the first time. You're one pitch away from getting out of this. Figure out a way to get it done. How are we going to pitch him? Well, in the third inning, he started him with four straight breaking balls. This is how he got him out. In that inning, he made a real good pitch with a breaking ball and then two really, really ugly pitches of breaking ball. Somehow comes back with one right on the corner to make it two and two. Tries to get him with a fastball. Hart fouls it off. And then ended up hanging a breaking ball and, and getting away with it. Corey Hart swinging through it. Same situation now in the fifth inning. Fast ball off the plate. And he must know that he's got to get Hart or he'll be taken out of the game. And should. Yeah, this is his last hitter. I don't think there's any doubt in our minds about that. So he's got to figure out a way. 2 and 0, oh, and he's got to throw it over the plate. Hart has struck out swinging twice against Pino. Two and 0 oh to Corey Hart. Rolled with a lot of spin on it. Harley fires to Pino. That ball started up the baseline and spun out toward Brian Dozier. And Pino completes five innings. And the Mariners leave the bases loaded again.
with Johan Pino, and he's really excited to take the mound tonight. He's almost certainly done for the night. He's got a chance to pick up his first major league win on one of the oddest outs you'll see all year long. There's Trevor Plouffe to lead off the six for the Twins against Joe Bimel. A couple of years ago, Brian Dozier got a hit on a ball like the one Hart just hit. Dozier hit it about five foot foul, and there was so much spin. He hit it right off the end of the bat. There was so much spin that the ball rolled back into fair territory. This one appeared to be headed right up the baseline and then took, took an abrupt turn. angle <laughs> toward <laughs> Brian Dozier. An absolute left turn. And I'm going to tell you what, Chris Parmley made that play look a lot easier than it was. That was a fine play. One and one to Plouffe. And the ball fouled back. Plouffe, Escobar, and Fold in the sixth. The one really, really good part about that was that the ball stayed on the grass and never got to the dirt spinning that hard as right. hard as it was spinning because it no telling what might have happened if the ball got to the dirt. And another one fouled back. Bimel came in, gave up the two run double to Morales. Eventually got Arce on a ground ball, now starting his first full inning. At least we presume he'll have every chance to complete the six. Well, a hit off the end of the bat foul. Here's the final pitch and out of the inning. <laughs> That's, look at this play by Parmley, though. He, he made a very, very nice aggressive move to go get the ball and then a Nice spin to turn and make a nice throw to uh, Pino, who did a good job of covering. This is all in all very, very nice defensive play. But I, I don't know that other than Dozier's ball that went from foul to fair, I don't know that I've ever seen a ball take that kind of left turn like that. It was started right up the line. And now Plouffe up the line, dribbling one. Here's the pitch by pitch to Corey Hart. And Pino really struggling off the plate with a fastball, low and away with a fastball, gets a 2 0, has to come in with a fastball, and Hart hits it right off the end of the bat. And as we said, Parmley made a <laughs> very nice play, and Guardy's happy. Guardy wants his kid to get a win so bad. It's fun to watch Guardy pulling for his players like that. Guardy wants a win for the team, but also for Johan Pino. 2 and 2 to Plouffe. So now he just has to sit and wait. He's pitched five innings, gave up just one run. A couple of innings were a little wobbly, but he left the bases full twice. And another foul by Plouffe. Well, if Kyle Gibson told you uh, and told many people last night that he didn't have his best stuff, if you talk to Johan Pino after the game today, he's going to tell you that was not his best stuff stuff or command that he took out there uh, tonight but he got through five innings he's the pitcher of record in a four to one ball game so let's hope the twins can hold it nice play by Bible one away and that'll bring up Eduardo Escobar Escobar's slump has hit both sides of the plate. Is that what you experienced as well when as a switch hitter when uh, things weren't going well that it affected both your right-handed and left-handed swing? Not so much for me. I it uh, I was I was kind of two different hitters for the most part. The drive to right. Saunders back and still back and right in front of the fence makes the catch to a win. And before Fold gets on base here with two outs in the sixth. <laughs> now on FoxSportsNorth.com, Tony Oliva recalls playing in the 1965 All-Star Game and what it's meant to him to be in Minnesota ever since arriving in the majors. That story and more. All-Star Game coverage at FoxSportsNorth.com slash All-Star Game. Tony added to the game when Mickey Mantle could not play because of an injury. 
Here's Fold. He has reached in eight of his last nine plate appearances. One and oh. Two of them. Sam Fold playing very, very well. He's played good center field for the uh, Twins ever since he got here. Went through the concussion uh, injury and symptoms for quite a while and then came back and picked up right where he left off defensively. But he's been a little catalyst here offensively as well in the last 15, 18 games. Well, you'll hear, you'll, uh, hear managers from time to time talk about how they like to have. A number nine hitter with some speed yeah. who can do some things and fold certainly fits that category two and one. When you, hit, when you hit ninth in the uh, American League, uh, it's you really are uh, a bit of a, uh, a, a can be a bit of a catalyst and, and a second a kind of a second leadoff hitter because. You get an awful lot of chances to uh, drive in runs when the the fifth and sixth hitters get base hits, maybe the seventh hitter as well. You get you're up in big situations, but you also get up a lot like this when you're leading off or uh, with two outs where you can get a base hit and, and steal a base. He's going to be retired, I think, this time. Fold uh, retired, and Bible has a one, two, three, sixth inning. Toyota takes you. Test drive one at your Toyota dealer. Toyota, let's go places. By Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. For the everyday competitor in all of us. And by McDonald's. Stop in all summer for a cool, refreshing McCafe iced coffee. Starting at just $1.59. Twins uh, trying to make it three out of four here in Seattle. Leading by three. And not very often Anthony Swarzak is asked to come in with the twins in front, but that's the situation here in the sixth. Anthony Swarzak has done a very, very nice job as the long relief man, and you're right. Oftentimes he's in, in I would say most times, in the game when the twins are behind. The starter's been knocked out early. Strike one to Morrison. Swarzak asked to come in and hold the other team right where they are so the twins can peck away, get back in the game. Here he's pitching with a lead. Here in the sixth inning, and Andrew Ron Gardner would love to have him get through the sixth and and seventh if he can, but certainly stop him right here in the sixth and, and get into his seventh and eighth inning matchups in the bullpen before getting to closer Glenn Perkins if he needs to. 
Morris and Saunders and Zanino to face Swarzak here in the sixth. Line to Pluth. Down. Well, that'll bring up Saunders. Twins fans, you can get your tickets now for the July 19th game against Tampa Bay at Target Field. The first 10,000 fans will pick up a new pair of Twins branded headphones presented by Delta Airlines. All 833 Twins or visit twinsbaseball.com and get your tickets. Saunders with a single and a strikeout continuing to hit 500 against the Twins. Ball one. Two and a. The bullpen for the Twins in charge of preserving Johan Pino's first major league win. Hold opportunities, perhaps save opportunities. Dribbler to Zuki will pounce on it and throw a nice catch by Parmley with that ball sailing across the foul line, two away. Just another example of the complete player as a catcher, Kurt Suzuki is. Or not too many that make that play any better than Kurt does bouncing out from behind the plate jumping on that swing and bunt something in his left eye yep. two down on the sixth and now Zanino and the first pitch strike I think when you catch a uh, a team like the Mariners in the streak that they're in where they're not scoring a lot of runs, not hitting with runners in scoring position. Very important for a pitching staff to understand. Just got to throw them strikes and, and and don't walk anybody. Don't give them any other opportunity for one hit to uh, make a big difference, make more of a difference than uh, than they would have to get two or three or four hits in a row to, to score a run or two. Don't. Don't give them any free passes. Don't give them any extra opportunity to score and throw strikes. Because if a team's not hitting and you, and you punish them with strikes, they're going to continue not to hit. If a team's not hitting, you walk people, go 2-0 and 3-1. Oh and and it gives them a feeling of that they've got a chance. And This is a team that's down. You've got to jump on them. You've got to punish them with, with strikes and, and no free passes. 2-2 two and two to Zanino. Call third strike. Swarzak breezes through the sixth on to the seventh. The Twins up by three. Second inning, Kyle Seeger smokes a Johan Pino fastball into the seats, but then the Twins come right back. Double steal with Fold and Dozier. Zanino throws the ball in the left field and 
full scores. Later on, Kendrys Morales with a rocket double scoring both Suzuki and Parmalee to give the Twins a 4-1 lead. Pino up against Corey Hart with the bases loaded twice. Gets him on a breaking ball the first time. And then one of the weirdest ground balls you'll ever see, a left turn from the first baseline. And Chris Parmalee makes a very nice play and gets out of the fifth inning. Johan Pino, the pitcher of record here as we head to the top of the seventh with a chance to win the game. And Brian Dozier will lead things off for the Twins in the seventh. Kurt Suzuki, Chris Parmalee will follow. And they'll all uh, be uh, facing Dominic Leon. Dominic Leon, first time I saw him pitch last night, and he's got some good stuff. Throws hard, has two different speeds of breaking ball. This kid has a nice arm. Dozier, Suzuki, and Parmalee. Fox Tracks presented by Carrier. Fastball and strike one. Dozier with a single, stolen base, run scored in the third. Dozier's 66th run scored this year. One and one. Called a ball, but a nasty pitch could have been called a strike. That's one of the two breaking balls that Leon has. Real good angle on that breaking ball, both down and away break. Dozier last year led the Twins in run scored with 72. He's got a chance to get to that by the All Star break. One and two. Story goes, Paul Molitor. Told him in spring training, look, let's see if we can get you to 100 runs. You're going to be hitting primarily as a leadoff man. Make it a personal challenge to score 100 runs. Well, he's well on his way to doing that. Two and two. And a fastball gets him. One down. Tomorrow at the Minneapolis Convention Center, my family will be there. The All Star Fan Fest gets underway. And here's a look at the schedule of events at the Fox Sports North booth. Hours 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. You can visit the Fox Sports North booth on Friday for a chance to win admission to the Taco Bell All-Star Sunday events. That includes the Futures game where Burt Blylevin will be managing the international team against Tom Kelly's U.S. team. I think uh, those who will be going to Fan Fest will really find it a fun time. It's a great baseball atmosphere and Imagine there's some people that might get there early in the morning and stay till the evening hours. One and zero to Suzuki, and now two and zero. Good under good day at the plate for Suzuki. A walk on the first, sacrifice fly that gave them the Twins their first lead in the third, then a single and a run scored in the fifth. Chop to the right side. Cano to his left. Has to wait for Morrison to get to the bag. Two down. Can you beat the best? Join millions of players now on the only official home run derby mobile game from MLB.com. Square off against your friends from around the world live in multiplayer derby mode and climb to the top of the leaderboards. Download today for free on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Brian Dozier will be a real live participant. And word came today that Justin Morneau has accepted an invitation to hit for the National League. Morneau will be the only left handed batter among the 10 competing. 1 0. Oh. As of right now, Morneau not on the National League All Star team. That could change. With injuries this weekend, withdrawals that players may make because of illness injury or whatever remember I think when they had the all-star game here in 2001 I know for sure Mike Cameron was added late I think there was another Mariner that was added late and they went from six Mariners to eight on the weekend before the all-star game was to be played here in Seattle one and one 
There's a drive to right down the line and a fair ball. Parmalee will round first, dig for second. Saunders with a long, wild throw, but backing it up is the third baseman Seeger. A two out double for Parmalee. And that'll bring up Morales. We told you earlier in the game we were going to have an AT&T fan photo tonight. And you can tweet your photo to hashtag North fan photo to be shown in a broadcast brought to you by AT&T. Two generations of Twins fans there at Target Field. It's a great thing about the great game of baseball, isn't it? It's just uh, something that you can enjoy with your with your kids and spend a lifetime talking about with each other. It's always been that way. One of the greatest privileges that about playing the game, I, I think that I that I recognize about having the ability to play the uh, opportunity to play the game is. Talking to fans and, and realize how much they're into the game and how how we as players actually come into the living rooms and kitchens and <laughs> of, of fans and, and uh, how they talk to their kids about it share share baseball with kids it's just a it's a wonderful experience and to me one of the best things that's happened in the ten year time I've been doing this is the growth of girls softball and girls can play a game that. They can see them form of at the ballpark or on TV, listen to it on the radio. There's so many more people who now can relate to this game. Here's a chopper to second, whether it's baseball or softball. Morales retired the twin strand Parmalee at second, and we go to the bottom of the seventh. Well, I know it meant a lot to him. He wants to come back there, and I, I know he talked about tipping his hat to the fans and just getting a chance to come back and play in front of him like that. So, you know, that's huge for him. I'm happy for him. I wished he would have made the team. I thought that would have been cool, him standing out in the line. But coming back for that home run contest, there will be a lot of people there rooting for him. And, uh, you know, we all know what he means to Minnesota and what uh, he did for this organization. So class act, him and his wife, uh, it would be fun to see him. Speaking of Justin Morneau, not uh, winning the fan vote for the final spot, but uh, practically what this means as it stands right now, if you uh, want to be a part of that, I think, very touching moment when Justin Morneau is acknowledged in front of the fans of Minnesota and he will acknowledge the fans, you'll have to be there Monday and not Tuesday because that's when the home run hitting contest is. Strike on the outside corner, one and one to Bloomquist. Bloomquist, Chavez, and Jones in the seventh for Seattle. I will tell you that if I were interested in fielding some home runs hit by Justin, I would stand out in the plaza beyond right field yeah. 
Look for a one hopper hit to be way out there on the plaza. Justin's going to be trying to pull the ball down the line. He's going to be pumped up. He's going to hit some bombs way back there. And I think the best chance you have is to be back there uh, maybe by the uh, by the statue of the glove. <laughs> <laughs> With safety glasses and a helmet on. And uh, wait for the ball to be out there, maybe one hop it back there. Justin's going to be trying to hit it to uh, First Avenue, I can tell you. Two and two to Bloomquist. Chopper to short. Easy play for Escobar. One down. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Minnesota Twins and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of Minnesota Twins, LLC. One down and now Chavez. Single got as far as third base in the fifth inning. Strike one. I want to ask you something. Um, we all know these are grown men out here, and I'm not a, been a big believer in bulletin board material or anything like that. But if you were in the Twins clubhouse on their roster. And you got wind of what the Mariners were doing. Would you would you react in any way to what they have decided to do in taking Felix Hernandez and moving him back a day and just in essence running the bullpen out to pitch the series finale? I think the reaction was uh, would first of all be total relief. <laughs> a one out single for Chavez. That you uh, come in for a four game series and miss King Felix. Right. I, I, the first thing I think on every hitter's mind in the Twins clubhouse is, well, now, isn't that good news? Yes. And because of that, I think you'd be excited to say, yeah, bring on the bullpen. We'll, uh, we'll tattoo those guys and not have to worry about. Uh, about Felix Hernandez. So I don't think there. I don't think there's a whole lot of hurt feelings. I don't think there's a whole lot of bulletin board material. I just think it's a lot of real, real excitement about getting up there against anybody else. Swarzak will come out, and James Jones will face Brian Dunsing. And then Andy Chavez got a single that got Sorzak out of the game because of this left handed leaning lineup that the Mariners have. And now the Twins will go to one of the strengths they have their left handed relief core starting tonight with Brian Dunsing. Brian Dunsing very very good in this role seventh inning matchup uh, for uh, Ron Garden higher matchup against left handers. He also has done a very nice job. When he's had to pitch a couple of innings against the uh, the whole lineup of the opposing team, getting right-handers out as well. But this is the strength that uh, of the uh, bullpen that Ron Gardenhire 
has and get to the seventh inning and match up lefties and righties. Fastball inside, ball one. Against uh, the opposing team's left handed and right handed hitters. Jones with a single and three trips. He's handled left handers about as well as righties so far this year. And a strike. Just one other footnote to this four game series where the Twins won't face Felix Hernandez. A couple weeks ago, they had a four game series against the White Sox and didn't have to face Chris Sale. Ended up sweeping Chicago. One and one to Jones. And now one and two. In this series, the Mariners have scored four runs on three solo home runs and a sacrifice fly. One and two. And a liner to center a base hit. And that will get Cano to the plate, representing the tying run. First and second, one down. Of inside out swings, both yep. by Chavez and Jones, and they are rewarded with base hits. Yeah, really good point. I was just going to say that there's easy. To, it's easy to see why James Jones doesn't have the, any more trouble against left-handers than he would against right-handers. He waits a long time, slaps the ball the other way, doesn't try to get out in front of the fastball, so that he was able, was able to stay with that curveball really, really well and line it to left center. And now Cano with a pair of singles and a fly ball to center. The first pitch a fastball, strike one. Cano five for 15 against Dunson. Well, the left hand hitter doesn't have an awful lot of problem with yeah. left handed pitching right here. Cano leads the Mariners by grounding into 10 double plays. One strike to Cano. Big swing and strike two. Good breaking ball in a really good spot right there. Cano, Brian caught Cano cheating on a fastball a little bit uh, right there. Had a pretty good, pretty good rip at it. Uh, wasn't way out in front of it, but Dunsing threw it in a real good spot. He's going to have to continue to do that. He's going to get Cano out. He's got. To, he's got to make some good pitches here. Back up by Suzuki. One and two. Mariners filled the bases in the third and left them filled. Did the same thing in the fifth. A pair of one-out singles. Escobar and Dozier bunch together a little bit in the event that one or the other gets a ground ball. Hopefully with the ability to turn two. One and two to Robinson Cano. Where Cano is dangerous too, because he also now with two strikes taking the kind of a left field approach. You can see he was late on that fastball, and that's by design, letting the ball travel an awful lot so that he's not fooled by uh, breaking balls. And when you've got a uh, a guy with this kind of talent that's willing to wait a long time and hit the fastball left, and it really cuts down on the pitches that you can throw him successfully. And he chops that one foul.
Mariners with nine hits, the Twins with just seven. Mariners with eight singles and a home run. Another one, two. Two and two. Single in the third and a single again in the fifth, and that brought Seeger up with two men on. The Twins walked him in each case. And another foul ball. He does strike out. 44 times and 340 at bats. With just 17 strikeouts and 133 at bats against a lefty. Basically, against lefties, he's about as tough to strike out as Kurt Suzuki is. Jared Burton's warmed up in the event this inning gets to Corey Hart. And that strikeout ratio against left handers is just another punctuation about. How he approaches left handed hitters. He is content to let the ball, the fastball travel, slap the, that ball, hit that ball left field so that he can stay on the breaking ball. Like that. Dozier can't find it and it rolls into center field. Hit him right in the palm of the glove and came out. And they're loaded up now for Kyle Seeger. A hit for Cano, his third single of the night. Well, pitch by pitch basis here, Dunsing does a good job of getting ahead and then throwing a real good breaking ball to get him on two. But now Cano is in defensive mode. He is just waiting a long time on that fastball so that he can handle the breaking ball. Gives him a good look at it, ability to look at the ball a long time. Finally gets a breaking ball in the middle of the zone and just hammers it. It takes Brian a little bit by surprise. The ball was hit so hard and it kind of mid jump there. It hit him in the heel of the glove. Not a bad play by Brian. He just couldn't find it. And now a first pitch strike to Seeger. Twins don't have the luxury of the having an open base here facing Seeger. They have to pitch to him. He's homered and walked twice to fill the bases. Three straight singles. Popped up, short left. And Willingham with the catch. Here's the throw coming through to the plate. Cut off, and now they get the out of third. No, oh, safe at third base. Jones safe at third. The cutoff made by Plouffe, who looks into the Twins' dugout like they may want to review this one. One run scores. Chavez coming in from third. It's four to two, and we'll see whether the Twins want to challenge this call at third base. Willingham makes a good throw but to hit the cutoff man here, and Trevor does a nice job there. I don't think he touched the base. I'm not sure. Trevor made the made the right call, uh, the right play there, not only cutting the ball off and trying to get the out at third base, but also charging the throw. He did a good job, made the right decision, made a good job of trying to pull off that uh, that play right there. It looked on replay that Jones slid in head first and his hand hit Escobar's left foot. And then Escobar was able to drop the tag. Take another look. You can see the glove on the hip of Jones and no part of Jones is on the base. Great shot of it right there. His hands clearly got to the vicinity of the base before the tag, but it looks like he never actually touched the base. Or if he did, for a split second, it came off. Right. And so we think the Twins will be successful in appealing and out, challenging and out at first and later in the game in a bigger spot at third base. You can see his hand touched Escobar's ankle and never did. Uh, Jones, yep. if he ever touched the base, he came off it. Yep. Great call. That's that's exactly what it looks like. 
So a run scoring now on a play like that. Plouffe is standing there. Is he told to cut the ball off by Suzuki? I could be that he was that he was told, but that's primarily the uh, third baseman's uh, decision right there, and he made the the right one. He's got to be able to tell where the runner is and where the throw is and make that decision. It was the right one because the the guy scoring is only the second run. It's only four to two. You get the out right there, you're out of the inning. That's a really, really smart play by Trevor. He made the right decision. It didn't look like the throw was going to get the, the uh, runner at the plate, take the what looks like is going to be the sure out. And I will tell you, from James Jones' standpoint, if he made the third out at third base in a four to now two ball game, he's not going to want to go back in the dugout. That's a, that is a no-no. And he'll not be at all uh, in favor of uh, extending the challenge rule in baseball. He's the guy that got called out at first base back in the <laughs> first right. inning. And this uh, review taking longer than the first inning challenge where Jones eventually was picked off the first base bag. The right hand hits Escobar's shoe and he clearly has been tagged there by Escobar. And you can see the shoe between the base and his hand there the whole time. Never looked like the hand got past the shoe back to the bag. So it looks fairly clear. Dale Scott in communication with New York. And he's out. Good call. The run scores. And the Twins come off the field. And now Ron Gardenhire is going to challenge whether the why the run scored. Oh, just confirming that in fact it did. list for the Rockies but Latroy Hawkins closing games for the Rockies so very strong former twin uh, influence and another Seattle reliever their fifth pitcher of the ball game and at least partially by design it's the first four have handled uh, things uh, I guess okay with Wilhelmson starting and not being able to complete three innings And now it'll be Charlie Furbush to pitch to the Twins in the eighth. Charlie Furbush, uh, one of the left-handers out there in the uh, bullpen for Lloyd McClendon's Seattle Mariner Ball Club. 
Josh Willingham will hit first, then Oswaldo Arcia and Trevor Plouffe. Well, three singles and a sacrifice fly after the first out of the seventh inning, and the Mariners end up with just the one run. And Willingham pops the first pitch up to short right. Saunders comes in. One down. Well, the Mariners got a run. They got a hit with a man in scoring position, but give you some idea about the, the rut that they're in. Cano's hit didn't even drive in a run. So they are two for 33 with runners in scoring position, but the run came on and out. So the five runs they've scored have come on three solo home runs and two sacrifice flies in this series. Here is Arcia. Back to the point about not walking anybody. Yes. And Arcia takes a strike on the outside corner. Arcia with three ground balls to the right side. Twins hoping to see some progress with Arcia using the whole field, and he's pulled it on the ground three times. And now to short center. Jones coming in. He won't get there. It might have cost Arcia a bat, but he'll take the knock. And a good example of why things are uh, are better for uh, Arcia. Not all the way there yet with what he's working on with Tom Brunanski, but his head is staying back better. He's not jumping the ball nearly as as much. And against this left-handed breaking ball, that's a pitch that we've seen Oswaldo Arcia out way out in front of a number of times, and he waits back just long enough because of what he's working on to stay with that breaking ball and get himself a little off the end of the bat knock. That's a that's that's improvement. Little baby steps here with uh, that young man, talented though he might be. He's got some things to work on. And now Plouf puts a charge in the one to right center field. But Saunders on the edge of the track makes the catch two away. A couple of first pitch outs here for Furbush. And now Escobar. Limited number of season ticket locations are now available in the Delta Sky 360 Legends Club. Enjoy the second half of the season in padded seats and enjoy the amenities that only the Legends Club can offer. The Delta Sky 360 Legends Club, the perfect combination of baseball and comfort. Of course, more info available at twinsbaseball.com and 1-800-33-TWINS. Here is Escobar. Among regular players, the only right handed batter who has done really well against left handed pitchers is Kurt Suzuki, hitting 325 against lefties. Danny Santana hitting over 400, but that's just in 32 at bats. Same number of at bats Aaron Hicks has, and he's at 286 against lefties. Bit of an anomaly this year that uh, the statistics that you're uh, reading there because uh, Trevor Plouffe generally mm -hmm. very very good against left-handed pitching. Uh, Josh Willingham generally very good against left-handed pitching. And they're uh, hitting lefties better than righties. Dozier is too, but you know there isn't a big number out there right. against lefties where somebody's just wearing left-handers out. Escobar with a fly to left. Furbush gives up a hit, but three outfield flies and a quick top of the eighth inning.
Out of uh, Seattle with three straight wins in advance of the series in Colorado. And the eighth inning specialist as the season has evolved is right-hander Casey Fiend. And he's been terrific in that role as the eighth inning specialist. A couple of hiccups uh, only in, for the most part. He's been very, very good. And the main reason, talk about throwing strikes, his, his whole demeanor is to come in firing strikes and it is much say to it is much to hit it here hit it. It's my best stuff against yours. Let's let's see you do it. And he's been very, he's won most of them. Came in and got a ground ball double play off the bat of Robinson Cano. In the eighth inning, two nights ago, he misses ball one to Corey Hart. Driven to the gap in right center. And Arcia can't make the play. Fold will get it back in. Hart has a single. Arcia went into a slide, and I'm not sure if he got leather on it or not. Hart will be aboard leading off the eighth. Looked like uh, Oswaldo Arcia was going to get to it here and maybe went into a slide just a little bit too early. Would have been a terrific play. Never touched it. No, nope. didn't quite get to it. I think he went into a slide a little bit early, but. Come on, come on. Well, Logan Morrison. <laughs> Morrison on the night. Two ground balls to the right side and a line drive to Ploof. Fiend sticks a fastball on the outside corner. Mariners now with 11 hits, 10 singles, and the Seeger home run. Driven to right. Garcia back for the catch on the edge of the track, and Fiend's given up a couple of well hit balls. Here in the eighth inning. And we'll bring up Michael Saunders. Ball didn't carry very well out there. Morrison hit it right on the button, it looked like, but he might have had a little bit of overspin on that ball. Arcia was able to get back, and the ball kind of came back down to him. And we've been talking about how the ball doesn't carry real well in this ballpark, and that ball is one. Another ball that looked like when left the bat, it would travel further than it did. Fiend misses the outside corner. Ball one. Thanks, he. Throwing that one 94 miles per hour. Foul away. Another one at 94. Yeah, he's been at 93, 94 a couple of times, and even at 95, he's. His arm is strong. He's feeling good uh, tonight. But as you say, a couple of well hit balls against him so far. Looks like they're going to try to backdoor a cutter here. And hits the corner. And the cutter at 89. They so do it, do it successfully, yep. Roughly a five mile per hour difference between the cut fastball and the four seam fastball. Right, and the main thing about the him, uh, Casey developing the cutter was uh, not so much the difference in speed, although it's it's that's uh, it's helpful. It main, mainly his fastball, even at 93, 94, 95, is pretty straight. Saunders has taken three pitches here, and the trainer and Lloyd McClendon coming out, and they're. Worried about his left side. And Saunders is going to come out of the ball game. Well, this guy's hit 500 against the Twins this year. And apparently, in a check swing or in stopping a swing, he might have tweaked an oblique. Yeah, two pitches ago, I think he fouled one off. It, yeah. yeah, right there. And, and he must have. Tweaked an oblique muscle or something right there, but it looked like they were pointing to the uh, to the back one, the left side. I'm 
have to see that again. But normally it's the front oblique or rib cage or, or some kind of rib cage muscle. It may could it may very well be that, but it's, it's normally the front, not the back. So it would normally be the right side to a left hand hitter that gets tweaked a little bit. One and two to Ackley. Pinch hitting in the middle of this at bat. Yeah, this is tough duty. There. <laughs> <laughs> well, there won't be uh, won't be a whole lot tougher uh, one <laughs> one pitches to see than than this one is. Now this was the check swing strike three, and you could see he was grabbing yeah. the backside, the back rib cage area. Yeah. Well, maybe if not on the swing itself. Aggravating it maybe on the check it swing could have been just the check. Yep, or it could have been a little bit of both the swing and then the, the pretty violent check when he did his rib cage started to turn with a swing and he and he held up. He might have he might have really tweaked it at that point. So Nino took a breaking ball from Fiend for strike one. And some weird things happen in this game, and I suppose any time a contending team is. Starting the game with a relief pitcher, you should expect weird things. Yeah, you're things. probably going to see some weird things, but there's a cutter again to uh, Zanino. And what we were saying about Fiend, he throws hard over this fastball, but it's straight, and he has developed the cutter to give a hitter just a little bit of movement to look at. A high fly right center field. RC chasing it down. And a scoreless eighth inning. Some balls hit in the air against Fiend, but no damage done. Twins have won two challenges. Full moon just had a batter leave the uh, ball game with a strained rib cage, it appeared, on a check swing. Mariners trying to get through this game now using their sixth relief pitcher. And just uh, Lucas Luke, you just added to, to the roster today. Uh, a little bookkeeping for you, for those of you keeping score at home. In the bottom of the eighth inning, Saunders left. On a check swing, injuring himself apparently. And Michael Ackley came up, uh, stood in the box for one pitch, took a call, third strike, uh, charged that strikeout to Saunders, not Ackley. Yet another example of uh, justice prevailing. It would be <laughs> terribly unfair uh, to charge that strikeout to Ackley. He, who now takes over in left field with Chavez going over to right. You got absolutely nothing to lose there if you're Dustin Ackley. You go up there, if you strike out, it's the other guys. You hit a home run, it's yours. 
I got to believe I'd have been up there hacking him, swing hard in case I hit it, even even though it's just one pitch. Of course, he was probably sitting back on the bench wondering what he was going to eat for in the yeah. post game meal. Yeah, played for a couple days. He's sitting there, all of a sudden, <laughs> grab a bat and helmet, go up there, and then Fiend paints the outside corner with a cutter. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Sam Folds reached twice again uh, in the ball game here tonight. Scored once, stole a base, was caught trying to steal on an apparent hit and run misfire. Well, you may be right. Up. You may be right on a lot of counts here. Uh, it, it may be the full moon that has caused all these things. It might have been the full moon's gravitational pull on that Corey Hart ground ball that pulled it from the <laughs> first base line almost all the way to second base. And, or it could just be that the uh, baseball gods are mad at Lloyd McClendon for for skipping King Felix and and uh, throwing the uh, whole staff against the Twins here in this game. Well, a leadoff walk on four pitches, and we'll see what Dozier's asked to do here. Carsoup.com trivia question. Which player has the most career RBIs against the Mariners? How about Mr. Puckett? Yeah, it's got to be Puck or Gary Gaetti. Herbeck. Wow. 85. I just remember Gary Gaetti killing yeah. the Mariners. Well, we got that right because Gaetti and Herbeck were very close roommates. That's right. <laughs> One strike to Dozier. Twins have led by as many as three. Now it's a two-run lead. And Perkins warming up in the bullpen. Check swing, but a strike on its own two. I'd like to obviously add another run or more here if you can. Haven't scored since the fifth inning. Difference in the ball game. Kendris Morales again, a two out, two run double back in the fifth. Double play grounder. Lindquist to Pinero. Two down. And we'll bring up Suzuki. Well, the Mariners aren't the only team that had to. Use their bullpen a lot. The Rangers really got thumped by the uh, Angels. And uh, they left their starter in as long as they could. Colby Lewis pitched two and a third innings, gave up 13 hits and 11 earned runs. 11. Ouch. In two and a third innings. Ouch. Curious to uh, check with Suzuki, the coaching staff, and the guys primarily in the infield how much, if the Twins win this game, how much credit Suzuki deserves and beyond the sacrifice fly and the run scored. His handling of Pino, it was a two to one ball game, and Suzuki made a wonderful save on a pitch in the dirt in the first critical Corey Hart at bat. But then it might have been two, at least, you know, in the, in, to the level I played. When the ball's cut off in the infield, the catcher is the one who used to call the cutoff and where to throw the ball. Maybe Suzuki calling for Ploof to cut the ball off and deliver a throw to Escobar at third base. Could very well have done that. I suspect that Trevor had he had to play right in front of him, and I, I suspect that he did that on his own. I hope he did because that's really his job. It, it would be great if the catcher helped him on that, but his job is to know is to take that sure out in that situation if, if that's what's warranted and it was two and two but I absolutely agree with you on uh, Kurt Suzuki's handling of of Pino because getting hard on the breaking balls that he did even when it looked like the breaking ball wasn't you know could have been thrown anywhere throwing that two and old breaking ball to Kyle Seeger that you know I mean Pino didn't call that two and old breaking ball Suzuki did and another base hit for Suzuki. Two more hits, a walk, and a sacrifice fly. He's two for three tonight. That's a tremendous, tremendous ball game and all the way around by that young man, an all star, Kurt Suzuki. And I will tell you, if it gives you any indication about this guy, one of the things that he's going to be less than happy, he, he won't be totally happy as well as he played because he swung and missed a hit and run. Yeah. yeah. And that's going to bug him. A lot, I will tell you, it will bug him a lot. Here's Parmalee. But he got his pitcher through five innings with a chance to win, and, and that's going to be the, the biggest deal for, for Kirk. Parmalee takes ball one. 
And of course, somewhere, Johan Pino is pacing, waiting for the bottom of the ninth, hoping that Glenn Perkins can get a save. Probably hoping right here, Parmley hits a two run home run, but that's not going to happen. Jones for the third out. Left Glenn Perkins will come in with a two run lead, trying to save Johan Pino's first major league win. Glenn Perkins on to try to close this one up. Twins lead 4-2 in the ninth. Here are three things about the former Gopher from fellow All-Star catcher Kurt Suzuki. He says he almost always hits his spots when he's on the mound. He said he's a very intense guy on the mound, but he's got a great sense of humor behind the scenes, always trying to make people laugh, both in the clubhouse and obviously out in that bullpen. And he does say he is an expert when it comes to crossword puzzles. A couple nights ago, guys, it was a 1-2-3 ninth for his 21st save of the season. That's the recipe here as the Twins look to leave Seattle winning 3 out of 4. Late 60s, early 70s. Ron Paranaski was the closer for the Twins. He amassed 76 saves and if Perkins can get the save here tonight, he'll tie Paranaski on the all-time saves list. And uh, the ninth inning here the other night, Perkins got Seeger, Morrison, and Bloomquist. Bloomquist on a ground ball. And it'll be Bloomquist leading off the ninth inning here tonight. Bloomquist, Chavez, and Jones with Cano hoping to hit fourth this inning. Missing the inside corner ball one. Bloomquist one for three. Chavez two for four. Jones two for four. Ninety three miles per hour and a fastball for strike one one and one. Bloomquist hit the ball the hardest of anybody uh, the other night hit a one hopper to uh, Escobar at short. He's actually hit Perkins pretty well four for eleven. In the center and full trots back. To make the easy catch one away. After the game the twins fly to Denver. In the opening game will be Chris Johnson who flew into Denver tonight because the team won't get there till just about well, I don't know 3 34 o'clock something like that. So Johnson there waiting for the twins Jorge De La Rosa will pitch for the Rockies in the opener. What I remember about the Denver Airport it's actually in Montana isn't it. <laughs> it's a long ways from anywhere. So we got a little bit of a bus ride at the yes, end of the plane do. ride. One down and here's Andy Chavez. To left hit right at Willingham for out number two. Again, a lot of outfield flies. Fiend normally doesn't give up too many outfield fly balls, but a couple of his outs were recorded in the outfield, and the first two here in the ninth off of Perkins. James Jones with two gone in the ninth. 
Jones has a couple of hits, but each time he's reached base, he's been challenged and ruled out. <laughs> Picked <laughs> off in the first on a challenge and then a third base on a challenge. Strike one. He's got his third hit, and Cano will have a chance. Three singles for James Jones. Well, let's pick him off again because Cano six for eleven off a of perk. Five singles on a double. If the Mariners don't win this game, they can't blame the table setters. Chavez has a couple of singles. Jones has three singles. Cano already has three singles. Seeger has both runs batted in for the Mariners on, on a second inning home run and a seventh inning fly ball. Well, you can't blame the table setters as far as them getting hits and getting on base. You can uh, raise your eyebrows at uh, Jones allowing himself to get thrown out of third. Strike one to Cano. Again, giving up five singles on a double and a walk to Cano in their history together. Oh, and one. Oh, and two. And I suspect that won't be the last foul ball we see. We saw Cano against Dunsing just flip one foul ball after another and then finally got a base hit. And a line drive in and out of Dozier's glove at second base. Perkins, of course, with a crisper fastball than Dunsing. 0 oh 2 to Cano. Blocked by Suzuki. One and two. Robinson Cano. Perkins deflects it. Escobar recovers, fires, down him. Perkins gets the save. Johan Pino, after 10 years in the minor leagues, gets his first major league win. And the Twins take this series three games to one. Anthony LaPanta, Twins lost the first game here. Didn't score a run in the game, but they came back to win the final three and take this series three games to one. 